from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Um, Trevor, before you sit down, come on up, come on up. Don't, and, and, and face. No, you got to stand up, brother. Yesterday was Trevor's birthday. Oh, no, wait. Because it's yes, it was yesterday, you can't worship, worship, wish him happy birthday today. Sorry, now you got to sit down. Anyway, happy birthday. Stand up again. <laughs> Sorry. Ed tells me I embarrass people too much. I don't know what he's talking about. But we are so blessed with Trevor. Trevor is a good man. Um, he is faithful in everything. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord's people. And uh, brother, it's my hope that the Lord will give us more and more good men and good women, but men like you uh, as, the, as the years progress. Thank you, and happy birthday. He's 30. Yeah, man. And he's all alone. His parent, well, in the sense, in the sense that his, well, his mom and dad are out of town. They are camping. And y'all can sit down. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Wow, I don't know if they're standing for you or what, but, but um, I don't know how he's doing for meals. Uh, um, with his folks out of town, but uh, he hasn't complained, but I think he's, he hasn't been looking too happy. Uh, anyway, happy birthday, my friend. Yeah. Very good. Well, as I mentioned uh, a week or two ago, Sandy and I were out of town last Lord's Day. We were up at the Hispanic Leadership Initiative Conference in New Braunfels T-Bar M Ranch. <laughs> And we had a good time seeing friends and uh, making new friends, seeing old friends. Um, but we're really glad to be back. Uh, it's just amazing how much it's growing up there. I mean, San Antonio, New Braunfels are almost just one big city now. Uh, just amazing. And all the, the, the highway overpasses and bypasses in San Antonio, what do they call it, the ribbon? Uh, looks like a, a big bow tie in the sky supported by uh, not a bow tie, a pretzel in the in the sky, supported by pillars. That's how that's how the the highways are there. It's growing so much. We had a good time, but it's it's so good to be back and and be with you all. I mentioned then, though, before we left, that I'll be we'll be going through first. It'll take us at least through Christmas to finish um, up in First Thessalonians. It may take longer. Uh, today, I'm just going to be preaching from verse 14, the first part and making reference to some of the other verses in there, but we're going to be going through 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 18 for the next few weeks, um, taking it bit by bit, verse by verse, because it's such an important doctrine. And as you see at the end of verse 18, Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So, how can you be encouraged? They encourage one another if you don't know the words. Um, and I hope you will know them well. I hope I can explain them well enough to encourage you. Uh, the resurrection of our bodies is the Christian hope. We have reason for it because Jesus our Lord was raised from the dead. He conquered death. As, a vice, as I have studied and meditated on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, I have come to... I would say understand that these verses certainly deal with the resurrection of our bodies when Christ returns, but that's really secondary to what the most important 
heart of these verses, the, the most important uh, thing that we see from these verses. Um, first and foremost, these verses speak of the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior. As I've studied and meditated on these verses, my mind has been taken up in that. The glory of Christ, our Savior. Oh, what a wonderful glory. And friends, we will see his glory. It will be seen publicly and acknowledged by all when he returns to raise the bodies of everyone who has died. This man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is faithful to us forever, will not forget us, and he will come. And we will see the astounding feat of him having all power, all glory, in and of himself, raise what has died and decayed and gone into the grave or wherever it has gone in death, the ocean, fire, Every body, every person, the body of every person who has ever lived will be raised. This is literal. This is just not a figurative thing that we would say, wow, this, this, this idea really shows us the glory of Christ. That's the, that's the wrong way to look at this. And a lot of Christians, unfortunately, have fallen into that idea of, well, this really can't happen. It's just a way of expressing the greatness of Christ. Oh, Brothers and sisters, it will happen. It's a literal fact. Or it's a literal truth that will be fact. It will happen. It will be as real. The body you have after it goes in the grave will come back, flesh and blood. Everyone's. Christ will do it because he is glorious. This is his great power. This is the wonder of Christ. So when we think of him, we realize he is the Lord of glory. And when we think of what he will do when he raises the dead, it gives us a greater, perhaps, I hope, it gives us a greater, deeper appreciation of his lordship and of his gloriousness, for which we should praise him daily and give him thanks and entrust ourselves to him. This great revelation of his divine glory will not take place in secret. As the scriptures say, down a few verses, there will be the loud shout of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth will see it. And then the words of scripture will be fulfilled where, that Paul that we have in Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 2 where he says, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This will take place when he raises the dead. Every tongue will confess, not just those who loved him and waited for him. All mocking will end. All ridicule will stop when he is declared the Lord of glory. Let us, let us be among those who will, declare his, who will declare this with joy. For many will declare it with unpitied fear and sadness. They will be compelled to proclaim Jesus Christ the Lord, much to their shame and their sadness. Let us not be among those people. The last time we were together, the Holy Spirit spoke to us from verse 13. The main idea of that verse is that we have a sure and certain hope of eternal life in our bodies because Jesus Christ will return and raise our bodies from the grave. This is our great hope. And Paul says, therefore, we, we shall not grieve. We should not grieve like those who have no hope. Well, you can talk to your friends out there and they're not Christians and they'll say, oh, I have a hope. But really what they mean, because it's not based on any fact, it's just a, a positive thinking. Our, our hope is, it's a real hope. So they have no hope because it's just, well, we're not sure if it's going to happen or not, but we want to remain positive that we will go to heaven when we die. Don't really know. 
The hope that we have is not like that. It's not a mere positive thinking. It is something that will happen that we are trusting in and looking forward to. That's, that's biblical hope. Sure of something. It will take place. We will get it. It's just a matter of waiting for it. So that's why we have hope and they have no hope. That's what verse 13 tells us. We have hope because Jesus will raise our bodies. So today we'll hear the Lord's voice from the following verse, words of verse 14. These words, Jesus died and rose again. These words tell us that Jesus Christ is the dead. He is the Lord. I beg your pardon. Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the ruler. He is the master of death and life. We might think that, well, when someone dies and whoop, that's it, Christ has nothing to do with them anymore. They're just out there somewhere doing something in hell or wherever they might go. Some people might think, oh no, uh-uh. Jesus is their Lord. He is their master. He rules over them even in death. Our Lord is Lord of all. His dying and rising from the grave proves it. Nothing is outside his realm. Nothing is outside of his, of his control. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 14, verse 9, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be both, he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. Many people daily reject Christ's rule over their lives. They don't want Him to be their Lord. I think sometimes, they, because this is the sin in them, and uh, for which they are responsible for, make, uh, in, in acting out, when they hear the word Lord, it's like, I'm the master of my own destiny. I will live life by my rules as I see fit for my own purposes. And they don't want, when they hear the word Lord, or they reject him as Lord because they just don't want any authority over them. Who, no one will tell me what to do. I will live the way I want. Yes, that's true. That's, in that sense, Christ is Lord. He rules our lives. He has demands on us. He has the right because he is our creator. But at the same time, we mustn't, and we need to help people realize this, we mustn't just think of him as the Lord as he just makes demands on us. Do this or else. No, as the Lord, he's willing to help us. I am your Lord. I am your master. I will care for you. It's like, we don't know it much in our society, but in ancient societies, you had people who were, who were servants in a household, and the, 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 the man of the house, the head of the house, was the Lord. And he had demands on his servants, rightfully so. But yet, he would also care for them. That was part of his responsibility. He would... He would make sure they were clothed and that they were fed. And if he was a good Lord, good master, he would not treat them wrongly. He would have compassion on them. Because they were a lot of times a part of his own household. And that's how Christ is to us as our Lord. And, and I encourage you to think that way of him often. He will care for you. He is a great Lord, a great master. He is kind and generous. He will fulfill all his obligations towards you. But he does say, you are part of my household and there are obligations, rules upon you. I want you to live as a member of my household. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. 
And we must, we must call upon the Holy Spirit to do this work in us so that Christ will not be just some master, an ogre, or, or give me, that's probably not a good word, just someone that outright fear. Oh, he's good and kind and gentle. But many, many people live their lives by their own rules. They reject his lordship completely. And when death comes, they think that they have succeeded, that they have lived the way that they wanted, and they've made it. Christ has not touched them. They've done what they wanted, lived how they saw fit, pursuing their own goals, their own pleasures. I was the master of my life, they boast at the end. But when they close their eyes, in death they will see him. Even death can't keep Christ out of their lives, can't keep him out of anyone's life, because he is the Lord, both of the dead and the living. There is no escape from the one who is the Lord of the dead and the living. Even the most powerful and independent people on earth cannot escape him. Danny and I watched a really interesting movie the other day with, with friends. It's called The Sunset Limited. And it's basically, it's not basically, it was two men for an hour and a half dialoguing back and forth. Samuel L. Jackson, uh, really doing a good, good job of portraying a man who lives uh, kind of in the poverty-stricken areas of New York uh, in this kind of run-down apartment because that's where the sinners are that he wanted to reach, the drug addicts and the prostitutes and the drunkards. And Tommy Lee Jones, another great actor, probably because he's from Texas. Anyway, um, he was a, apparently a college professor who believed that the intellect uh, is the be-all and end-all of all things. I mean, uh, all reality is determined by the intellect. And, well, that was difficult right there. That would lead him to hopelessness, which it did, uh, because we can't know everything. And maybe that's what he's like, you know. Anyway, he said this physical world is all that there is. There is nothing more. And he was done with it. It had no more fun for him, no more pleasures, nothing more to seek out, nothing to understand, nothing to live for. And so he tried to throw himself in front of an oncoming train. Samuel, Samuel L. Jackson, the, the evangelist, grabbed him and saved him and brought him to his apartment. And for an hour and a half, they dialogued back and forth. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson character trying to save him as best as he could, being a really probably didn't even finish sixth grade, um, and and talking to this college professor. Um, the college professor finally walked out the door and said, "No, there's nothing but darkness. Life is meaningless, and I'm going to end it all. Because what is there to live for?" And then that would be it. He would be done. And he could say, ha ha, I have lived the way I wanted. Isn't that how it works? Yes, it is. People will do that kind of thing, throw themselves in front of a train saying, ha, I have been the master of my own life. I have even ended it according to my terms, according to my philosophy. Oh, but friends... Uh, there is no escape from the one who is the Lord of the dead and the living. And even as the most powerful and independent people on earth cannot escape him. If he doesn't confront us in life, then he will confront us in death. There is no hiding, no running, no freedom from him. This truth, apparently that maybe this, this uh, character played by Tommy Lee Jones didn't read David's, King David's meditations uh, that he wrote down um, hmm, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and, and are now 
put in the Bible as Psalm 139. David took time to meditate on the omnipresence, the everywhereness of God, and on his omniscience, his, his all-knowingness, if you'll permit me to use those terms. Both of which, omniscience and omnipresence by the glorious Holy Spirit, belong to Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. David wrote down his meditations, and they were placed, as I said in the Old Testament, as Psalm 139. Here are some of his words. You have searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it entirely. Well, there goes into human, <laughs> human pride and independence, isn't it? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the farthest distance of the universe, you are there. If I make my bed in the abode of death, you are there. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even darkness will not be dark to you. The light will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. David's words from Psalm 139 give us understanding of Jesus Christ who rose from death to everlasting life. Nothing is outside of his rule or his authority. Death cannot rule him. He rose from it. And even those who die are not dead to him. So let us not think that we can live our lives as we want and that he can't touch us in death. Let us instead humbly bow to him by submitting to his rule over us. And, my friends, accepting his kindness and his mercy toward us. And oh, how I wish that was preached more. Jesus is Lord. Yes, and what a good Lord he is. Kind and merciful to, and gentle to all who bow to him. And how, if, if, if nothing else, it, it's, it comes to this, saying, Lord, you, I cannot escape you. So I bow. And I gladly accept your kindness. He will extend a kind and gentle hand to all who bow in submission to him. What do I mean by in submission to him? Yes, keeping the Ten Commandments, certainly. But what I want you to hear today is more of the submission of saying, Lord, you rule my whole life. I cannot escape you. you. You know my thoughts from afar. Before there is a word on my tongue, O Lord, you know it all. If, if I were to die, <laughs> I can't escape you. So, Lord, I submit to you. I bow. I declare you my Lord. And now, deal kindly with me, your weak, sinful servant. Oh, my friends, that really is, is submission to Christ. Any, anyone can, not anyone, but we can, we can outwardly keep the Ten Commandments. We can outwardly do all, those good, all these things that the Bible says. That doesn't mean we've submitted to Christ. When we submit to Christ, it's, it's, it's saying, you know me. You see beyond the outward actions. You see beyond the speech. Lord, and so I bow to you. I acknowledge that of you. And I ask that you would be my kind and gentle Savior and friend. That's real submission because it's from the heart. It's, it's, it's true. We're not hiding anything. 
And then Jesus says, I am of a kind and gentle heart, and with me you will find rest for your souls. No more hiding, no more pretending, no more insecurity that comes from knowing that you really aren't who you portray yourself to be in keeping all the commandments. It's, it's admitting to Christ what's inside. And then obeying his commandments with a humility uh, that says, I know. Uh, uh, other people might think I'm perfect, but Jesus really knows the truth. No pretenses, no self-seeking, submission to the one who knows all things, and walking humbly before him with, with security because he will love you and he cares for you. You know, it's like, I suppose we could say Jesus would be like a, a parent Seeing their child who the child just thinks, you know, I don't know. You know how kids can be. It's been a long time for me um, since I was one. Uh, sometimes I still think I'm one. Or people might think I'm one. Um, but, but you know how it is when, when kids are small and they think they've just done something great. And the parent knows it's not great, but they love the child. And they will hold, take him in the arms and say, oh, that was really well done. You know, it's like, um, I've told you the stories of, of when the kids have, have uh, had their children's bulletin, and they, it, on the bulletin it says, draw a picture of the sermon. Well, often what they draw is a picture of me preaching. And, um, well, a lot of the kids in our church, I hope they're not artists painting reality, because they paint me as kind of, Someone with my arms outstretched and three hairs sticking up from my head. And another child long ago uh, couldn't, couldn't do hands. I guess hands are really difficult to draw. So it looked like I had pitchforks stuck in my arm and I was like this with three hairs sticking out. That was the picture of the sermon. I was like, well, child, that's, you're supposed to draw a picture of what I was talking about. But you know what? And they, the, the child just thought they had just done a wonderful job. It was just a perfect picture, and, uh, but I knew better. But I didn't embarrass him. I didn't say, that's really silly. It wasn't silly. It was the best drawing I have ever seen. And I've got it somewhere in my files. I love it. I adore it. Because it came from the child's heart. So imperfect. but so real. And that's how we have to be with Christ when we submit to him as our Lord. Knowing that we, you know, all our efforts to do, to be perfect are like drawing a picture of the pastor, but getting <laughs> three hair sticking up, pitchforks for hands and fingers. And Jesus says, I accept it. I adore it. It's not perfect, but I'm a good master. And I know if I d demanded perfection, it would not go well. Oh, but don't let me, don't think that he doesn't demand perfection. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, he demands it, but he knows that we're not going to give it. You know what? We will give it when our bodies are raised, and we will be perfect for him. And he will bless us for the perfection that he's given us. We will live a perfect lives for him because he's enabled us to live perfect lives for him in heaven. And he will, he will bless us for it. Oh, the wonder of his grace. He rewards his own grace, as St. Augustine says. But let's move on. Jesus Christ, the Lord of death and of life, won't forget or forsake us if we submit to him in this life. When he returns, we, in our spirits, we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, in our spirits, when we die, our spirits go immediately into glory. And then, this is just the most amazing thing, astounding. I have not been able not to think of it all week. And I've tried to elevate my thoughts and my affections to grab this 
this, this astounding, wonderful truth. Lord, how can I conform my life to this truth? that reveals Your great glory, this truth that will happen. Oh Lord, how shall I live my life now in light of what You're going to do and in light of what this shows me about You, what Scripture is talking about here? Revealing Your divine goodness, Your power, and the love that You have for me because You will come and You will raise my body. But here's the thing. When He returns, we, in our spirits, will be gathered by God the Father as if He's taking all His children in His arms. How that will be, I don't know, but we will be conscious, we will be fully knowledge in heaven, enjoying it forever, but without our, or enjoying it uh, without our bodies. And then the time will come when Christ returns. And the Father will bring with Jesus, Paul says, all who sleep in Him, that is all who died, whose bodies rest in the grave, and whose spirits are in heaven. We will be gathered by God, our blessed Father, and be brought by Him to see Jesus Christ, His Son, raise our bodies, raise our bodies from the grave. This is what the rest of verse 14 is talking about when it says, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. The Father, I can't think of it any other way. The Father wants to see His Son's glory as well. Because the Father loves the Son. And He wants to see His Son's glory. He wants, to, he wants just to be so happy with His Son. So be so filled with pride and delight when He sees His own blessed Son raise our bodies from the grave, fully conquering death and become the all-comprehensive Lord of all things. But parent does not enjoy that. Seeing their child succeed if you will and put it in thinking of it here using those words remember my daughters would uh, uh, okay I just have to say this they starred no that's that's not right I I beg your pardon my daughters were the stars uh, of the Nutcracker Ballet for many years uh, my daughter Elizabeth, uh, if I could just humbly say this as a dad, uh, no dad can humbly say things like this. You say it with great pride. She was the, the sugar plum fairy twice. No one else has ever had that award, brothers and sisters. The sugar plum fairy. And of course, me being a dad who's trying to be funny says, you were the plump sugar fairy? Is that what it is? It didn't get any laughs from her, just like it didn't from you just now. Did I tell you that my daughter Elizabeth was a sugar plum fairy twice? And that before her, her sister Emily was a sugar plum fairy? Did I tell you that? No. Um, I could go on and on. What parent? Uh, Thank you for allowing me to do that. I know you all have things you would love to stand up in here to say about your own kids. Because you love them. And you want the world to know how wonderful and great they are. It's the same. Not exactly, but it gives us an understanding of the Father's relationship to His own blessed eternal Son, Jesus Christ, who became a man and who will come and raise the dead. And the Father will bring us in our spirits to see it. And we will, with the Father, just be astounded and, 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 and give great praise to Jesus Christ. We will have the great privilege of seeing Him, the Lord of death and life, raise our bodies and give them new, powerful, and everlasting life, free from sin, free from shame, free from disease, and free from death forever. The Father wants us to see this. He wants to see his he wants us to see his son's glory. <clears throat> then Jesus will join our spirits to our risen bodies, like covering us with new beautiful and comfortable clothes, and we will gratefully, joyfully, and willingly bow to him and declare him our Lord. And we will live with him in happiness. 
My friends, these just aren't little Bible stories that we tell kids and you know, act like, oh, they're just neat little stories. This is true. This will happen. No one can escape from Jesus Christ. There is no freedom from Him, even in death. Let us therefore stop running. Let us stop hiding behind excuses for our sins. Let us stop attempts to rationalize away our sin and our guilt. Instead, let us turn to Jesus. Let us face Him and with bowed, humbled hearts confess our sins to Him and ask Him to forgive us and to give us new and everlasting life and to, and to maintain that life all until in this world until we see Him and He raises our bodies. Because He will maintain that life even in death. We, we do not die to Christ. This takes us beyond the objective physical world that we can see and touch. It takes us beyond our intellect because when we only deal with our intellect and say that's the be-all and end of all things, we can only go so far. And we always have to live in doubt anyway because we can't know all things. So we have the Holy Scriptures that reveal wonderful things to us that we would otherwise never know. Jesus is the Lord of life. He will give you what you seek. He will give you life forever and give it as a free gift. And I conclude with this. Everyone, everyone will bow to Christ and declare Him Lord. Even those who rejected Him in this life will bow. For He will raise their bodies from the grave and join and join their bodies their, to their tormented souls, because when all those who die in their sins without having had their sins washed away by the blood of Christ, their souls go from their body, but not to heaven, but into torment, into darkness, where they await the resurrection of their bodies by Christ. And then body and soul, they, they are... They are brought back together in a, uh, not to be joyful. But even to those people, He will give life. He will, he, will, he will give life to their bodies, rejoining them to their souls. They will live forever in the dark, lonely abyss. And there, in that darkness, they will bow. And they will call out, Lord! Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. There will be no answer. Let's pray. And now, Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of death and life, the Lord of all things, Help us to submit to you. Let our submission, O oh Lord, not be foolishly a submission that says, I will obey you perfectly. I will do all you command. We can't do that. Not now, not in these bodies as they are. Help us to submit to you in seeking your kindness, your mercy. Trusting that you will love us and care for us, even though we are highly imperfect. And to submit to you as the one who will raise our bodies from death. That is, to trust in you to do it. Even when we die and become absolutely helpless, we will not be hopeless. Because we submit to you, our Lord, the Lord of death and life. We look to you to raise us. We pray, O oh God, that you would Im impress us with these truths, that you would impress our children with these truths. It would make them joyful and confident in life. 
We pray, O oh most merciful Savior, that you would fill your church with this great truth all over the world, for our many are suffering. Many die, many are tortured, many live in insecurity because they are hated by governments, by other religions. We, we, are thank, we thank you that they do not have, that they are hopeless. Fill your church with this great truth. Let us long for that day. Let us think of it often when you will come and you will raise our bodies and we will see it. The Father will gather us and we will be astounded as we see our own bodies rising from the grave but having been made perfect, imperishable, unable to sin, to live in the new creation, to enjoy its fruits. Fill us with joy. Fill us with confidence. Fill us with wonder at this glory that we will see. Oh, Lord Jesus, how can we praise you? Our words are just mere child's babble compared to your greatness, which we will see when you come and raise us. Oh, blessed Savior, blessed Savior, wonderful Savior, glorious Jesus. You are that. Amen. Yes, we still have the Lord's Supper. Just because it's your birthday doesn't mean you can take a break, you know. Um, the Lord Jesus gives us helps in this life so that we can keep on going, so that we can have great courage. And some of these things are, you know, well, there's the preaching of His Word, which is the main way, and reading the Bible. And there's Christian fellowship, the encouragement that we give to one another. But then there's also special ways that are, if I may put it this way, outside the ordinary. The, the ordinary means of grace, yes, preaching, word, fellowship, things like that. But then there's extraordinary ways, unique ways that, that can only come from Jesus Christ himself. And we get those in the sacraments, particularly in the Lord's Supper, where he meets with us. And this life that is his, this life that is in his human body, this everlasting glorious life that has all power, he brings it to us in the Lord's Supper, in the sacrament. And our souls feed on it, really and truly, so that we can continue to be strengthened in this life. You know, I know often we don't think of the Lord's Supper, and I, I must confess that in my, I think in my pastoral career, ministry, uh, however you want to put it, this is where I've, I've failed a lot and not thinking about the Lord's Supper. Sometimes I come in and go, oh, that's right, it's the beginning of the month. We've got to have the Lord's Supper today. Hmm, not good, not good. I wish I could go back 25 years and start again. 30 years, actually. So we often, and maybe you've done it too, I mean, oh, that's right, it's the Lord's Supper. You know, thankfully, what transpires or what the Lord gives us in the Lord's Supper doesn't depend on us. It depends on His goodness and kindness. So even though we come in here and going, oh, that's right, it's the Lord's Supper. We come in unprepared. And I often, you come in because I've unprepared you. I'm sorry. I'm not prepared you. Well, <clears throat> nevertheless, we have a master who doesn't, who realizes that we cannot give perfection. That when we all draw pictures of the sermon, they're distorted in some way. We just cannot give perfection. And so he says, I am faithful to my covenant. I am faithful to my sacrament. I will feed you, even though you came in unprepared. Even though you had not washed for dinner. That kind of thing, you know. I will be faithful. He is our good and faithful Lord who will never desert us. 
He loves us too much for that. So anyway, we have the Lord's Supper this this morning, and uh, I think you all have the the, the elements there. Um, you didn't set up the table. Oh well. Again, what is the Lord's Supper? This is a time when we commune with Christ, when we reconnect with Him, when we com- recommit ourselves to Him, when we reestablish that covenant that we have broken so much. And he says, walk in my ways. We just don't. But he is faithful and he says, come my child, let me cleanse you. Let's, let's, let's get back together again. Let me cleanse you. And I just won't cleanse you. I will also give you what you need to, to go on. And sometimes we think, well, I don't feel anything happened. You know, uh, I'm supposed to feed on Christ crucified and risen and, and uh, his life comes into me. I didn't feel anything. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. I think when we're in heaven, we may be amazed at how often the Lord strengthened us in the Lord's Supper, and uh, even though we didn't realize it, because He's faithful to His covenant. And maybe, I don't know if it'll happen, but He could show us a picture. This is what would have happened to you if you did not meet with me in the Lord's Supper. We, oh my, I would have failed here and I would have failed there and I would have failed here and look at the mess I would have gotten myself into. Little did you know that I strengthened you and kept you going so that you said no to that sin and that sin and that sin. Even though you didn't realize that it was because of the food that I gave your soul when you had the sacrament. So that's what this is all about, a meeting with Christ Recommitting ourselves to Him, reconnecting, reestablishing the covenant, however you want to put it. I've included everything for Baptists and for independent Bible church people and Baptists. It's all there. Covenant, commit. This is what we're doing. This is what it's all about. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, uh, he took bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, he broke it as I do in his name. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. His body did not become the bread. It remained the man, Jesus Christ. If, If Jesus Christ had turned in, if the bread had turned into Jesus Christ, who was it giving them the bread? There's only one Christ with one body. But yet, when they took the bread, they had communion with him, communion with his life. Even as this bread has life in it, with vitamins and all of that, when we take it, it feeds us. But yet, that's when Christ comes in and does his sacramental action. And when we eat the bread, looking to Christ, our souls feed on Christ and receive the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Wonderful, wonderful truth. Reality. Special gift from Him. So He took the bread, He broke it, and He said, take and eat. This is My body, which is for you. And then after that, He took the cup of wine, and He said, this cup is a new covenant in My blood. Drink it, all of you. Uh, it's, It's the blood. It represents the blood that forgives all our sins. No more need for goats to be sacrificed or bulls or lambs. Christ's blood covers us, and we trust in that. And when we take this, it's grape juice. Just as it goes through our body and and affects every part of us, so his blood covers all our sins. We can trust in that. And he's saying, believe it. I am faithful to my sacrament. I will do for you what it represents. So then, you will take your, I trust you have one. If not, they're somewhere um, in the back. Um, I have big clumsy fingers. And this represents the body of Christ. And when we eat it, we feed on Christ. His life comes into us. 
Strengthen our souls. Amen. Let's take it together. And this beverage represents the blood of Christ, the blood that poured from his body on the cross, the blood shed for us so that our sins could be washed away. Because that's the kind of master he is. He just doesn't say, do this and do that, but he says, not only will I help you by feeding you with the great spiritual food, but I will even provide the way so that you can be forgiven of your sins and continue to serve me. That's what this blood represents. Let's take it together and have our sins washed away. And now, blessed Savior, we give you great praise and thanks. We ask now that we would leave here today filled with joy, and that you would help us to meditate on all that has been said and done today for our sanctification and for your great glory. Amen. We will uh, have our closing hymn. I beg your pardon. We will have the Lord's Prayer first, and then we will have our closing song of worship the ends of all the earth will hear. Indeed, the ends of all the earth will hear about the glory of Christ. They just won't hear it. They will see it. Would you please stand? We'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then we will have our, 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 our hymn. Let's pray to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn to number 368. The ends of all the earth shall hear. This is the last few verses of Psalm 22. You might know Psalm 22. It begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Said by Christ on the cross. Uh, it begins a little despairingly, but the end of the psalm is you will be very triumphant. 368, ends of all the earth shall hear. Bum, 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 bum. The ends of all the earth shall hear and turn unto the Lord in fear. All kindreds of the earth shall look and worship him as God alone. All earth to him her homage brings, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. Is the kingdom his of right? He rules the nations by his might. All earth to him her homage brings. The Lord of lords, the King of kings. All earth to rich and poor, both bond and free, shall worship him on bended knee, and children's children shall proclaim the glorious honor of his name. Thank you for your patience. May the Lord bless you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be and abide with you all now and forever. Amen. Please greet one another, Jesus, in Jesus' name. And remember social distancing. Some people still uh, would like that. The Lord bless you.